G'day humans, welcome to the safe space for dangerous ideas. Peter Hellier is one of the most iconic and hilarious Australian stand-ups, beloved of stage and screen, mostly small screen, but also sometimes big screen. He's been a fixture in our living rooms in Australia for a quarter of a century since he uh, he first appeared as a sidekick to Rove McManus in Australia's version of The Tonight Show at the time in the late 90s, uh, ran for a decade called Rove, and Peter was there making us crack up uh, all over the country. Uh, more recently, in 2014, he joined the uh, the desk of a show called The Project, which is an institution of Australian broadcasting. He was there for, uh, what was that, about eight years and, uh, and left the year before last. And then last year, he was on I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. He now appears as the narrator in uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, a live, well, is it the Rocky Horror Picture Show if it's live or is it just the Rocky Horror Show? You know the show I'm talking about. Um, so he's on stage at the moment and uh, I was so grateful to see him again. We have a little bit of, uh, of, of history in the sense that uh, shortly after I had got my break in New York City as a uh, host and producer on HuffPost Live, which was this new streaming television network with tons of money behind it and it was the hot thing and the place where all the celebrities would go and I would host three, four or five half hour shows every single day. It was 12 hours a day. It was all great. But in after I'd been doing that for about 18 months or so, uh, I was invited back to Australia because the host of the project, Charlie Pickering, was leaving the show and they were auditioning new hosts. So they brought me back um, I sat in the chair for a couple of weeks, ended up going back to New York. But in that time, working with Peter Hellier on a live television show at a panel desk, it's live, it's based on the news, it's fast, it's furious. He was so quick-witted, he was so hilarious, and he was so generous that it's a delight to see again my friend, the very talented, one and only, Peter Hellier. Well, we've started on this now, so how are, you, how are you doing? You've been... So I was looking at your bio, and it mm. said that you started on the project in 2014. Yeah, the, the, yes. I did 10 years there. Um, but the first two years were was me basically filling in for Hughesy. Like I did, like, one a week. He'd gone to, like, Monday to Wednesday. <laughs> Working as little <laughs> work, as is humanly possible. Yeah, the workaholic that is David <laughs> Hughes. <laughs> For some reason, I only wanted to do three days by that stage. And, um, and yeah, so I joined basically being his, his proxy and, um, and then he eventually left. He, he, he was kind of on the way out. Like he was, you know, I don't think I'm speaking out of school, not, just not enjoying it as much in that last year or so. Right. And, and I think 10 backed up a bit of a truck to him and uh, to go to get him to stay. And I, mean, I had dinner with him in Sydney actually and, and um, when, you know, he was definitely leaving and they, they'd offered me the job and, <laughs> he, actually, he actually said, oh, I don't think you should take it, mate. You know? <laughs> so, okay, you can leave the job, mate, but you don't have to talk me out of taking one. <laughs> so, exactly. You can be bored of it. I'm not bored of it yet. Give me time. Give me a couple of weeks I've before I'm over episodes, it. You know? I'm like, <laughs> That's right. It's, it's, uh, I mean, fresh. the reason it would surprise me that it was 2014 is because that was the year that I came, that Charlie left. Yes. And that I came yes. back and did it for a week or two. Yeah. And, that was, and you were so nice to me. And it was, I, I, I don't know if I've thanked you before, but you were like oh. very, very generous to me and like very welcoming. And you said lots of nice things about me. And it was a weird time in my life where I was just making it in New York and then they flew me out business class here and all of a sudden you know Charlie needs replacing so maybe yeah, you know, who's it going to be and yeah. there was like this sort of revolving door of uh, of, of interim hosts it was a while. strange year um, and yeah I mean you were, you were great so you, you know you're a lovely bloke so you're easy to be nice and I wasn't yeah, fishing for that, but thank uh, you I no, appreciate no. it but, uh, I, but, but, but my, you, yeah. we had different hosts like you know sometimes like it wouldn't even be uh, it'd be like three different hosts a week, right? You know, so you would have like it'd be me and Carrie, and then but then you would have, you know, you on Monday, and then Ray Martin on Tuesday, and then yeah, somebody yeah, else yeah. on while on on the, on the Wednesday. They were trying a few and, things, and, and yeah. Um, um, well, with me, it was a single block because I had to come back and do it, and then I had to go back to yeah. New York. But I, in my brain at the time, you were a fixture of Australian television. Mm. And to hear, to find out that you'd actually only also just sort of started, it was a, it was a funny. Well, I'd done ten years on Rove Live before that, and and before the game, did five or six years on that. So there'd been it probably wasn't you'd been was around. my first job, yeah. So I'd been doing stuff, you know, before uh, the project. But and the project for me was almost like a, 
we kind of called it 2.0. It was kind of like, you know, I'd gone from wearing hoodies on, on, on Rove Live and, and um, you know, being in sketches for Skit House and, and um, talking footy on before the game to, um, to, you know, wearing a suit and looking like yeah. an adult and, and uh, you know, still wanting to be silly and, and, and not – be too serious about it but it was you know um god you were funny you were very you were so funny on that show and for people who only know the project from the past maybe five years or so it might they might not remember that at the time it was a pretty big deal it wasn't a bunch of like woke youngsters just jabbering about the news like it was uh it was sharply satirical yeah it was kind of must see tv at the time yeah yeah absolutely and 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 Yes, I was at Sam Taunton show who um, took over from uh, for me, and he's a great guy and very funny comedian. And he makes the point, you know, and, he, and he's almost he's not saying it as an insider, but he's kind of saying everyone like the project is a massive. It, it is actually a massive brand. Like everyone in Australia knows the project. You, yeah, and everyone's got an opinion on the project. Yeah, I find that people who have the most opinions on the project are generally people who don't watch the project. <laughs> 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 I mean, the, the comments on the project, you know, when the story goes up from people who worked, didn't see the story, uh, they have very strong opinions about yeah, it. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, but uh, yeah, it was. It, it, it. I think it's like it's. I think it's Channel Ten, to be honest. And I've spent most of my career at Channel Ten. Um, I think there's something I, I I feel like they have shows that a lot of people talk about, like if, you know, amongst your friends and, and people will approach you on the street and talk about these shows that aren't always reflected in the ratings for some reason. I'm, right, and yeah, I, yeah. I know that's changed recently. The rating system has changed, and because it used to be the whole thing that you couldn't live in an apartment and have a ratings box. Now, if your your demographic that you're going after is a younger audience, like Channel Ten does, you know, a lot of them are going to be in, in apartments. So. I feel like shows like, um, you know, I, I'm a Celebrity and Survivor and, and feels like a lot more people are watching them than actually sometimes are reflected. So I'm not sure if the project falls on, on, under that or not. But um, I mean, there are, but I mean, isn't that just the way that we consume media these days well, yeah, in the sense that so much of it, even like the late night shows in the States where it used to be the case that everybody, you know, would get into bed and turn on Letterman or Carson. Yeah. Now, Jimmy Kimmel and Jimmy Fallon are just going for the clicks on Instagram the following day. So yeah. they're doing, you know, viral <laughs> moments that people watch it. On. I mean, they're basically in the same economy as like this show, yeah. right, where we'll say something, it'll go on Instagram, and most people will be consuming the project probably or a significant proportion of them from flicking through something on Instagram and watching I, a minute of it. To be honest, the I, like this. that's probably how I watch it. Like, <laughs> but now, seriously, because I don't sit down, I don't sit down uh, to, uh, to watch it gener- generally, um, which I mean, admittedly I didn't necessarily do before I mm. joined the show. It's just not at a time of day where I would be sitting down to, to watch something. Um, um, but I, yeah, I, certainly on Instagram, I, you know, I, I pick up their stories and, and if you, occasionally if I see an interview that I'm, you know, uh, I really want to see, I'll, I'll click the link and, and, and watch it. But, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. The way we are consuming media these days has completely changed. D- did you ever watch you? Um, not, no, not really. Um, no. Because I feel like there are a couple of types of people. There's like your letterman who never wants to see a single second of himself on television, just wants to put it out there and then let it be what it will be. And then you've got a Jay Leno who will sit down and go over and over and over his uh, his performance and micro, something, you know, yeah. microanalyze it and try to make it better. I am somewhere in between of that. Like I don't have a thing where like, I cannot possibly watch myself on TV. But if I feel like I've done a good job, I generally won't watch it back because I'm like, like let's let, that's that's kind of perfect or at least very good in my mind, so that can exist. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. But if I was to watch it back, I might find something that makes it not as good as I'm happy. Yeah, right, right. You know. So watch the shit and let the good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Let the good so, stuff be. But I mean, I, but I've also got used to watching myself back because I've had to. Like we did this, you know, it's a date and and how to stay married and and um uh, and I was in some of those and and, and the movie we made and so it, it's kind of like I've I've got used to being in an edit suite. And watching myself and, and kind of going, okay, and, and, and allowing other people to decide if I was any good or like, you know, and I can obviously have my say, can we not use that shot or there's a better take on, you know. So I've gotten used to watching myself, but I don't, I don't uh, seek out to watch myself. Back. And, and what about stand-up when you're building a set? How much do you go back and like listen to it and I, listen I, to I, the responses? I generally record every, every show that I do for a while and, then, and once you start the tour and you get into it, you stop recording it because you, you, you're not listening to it back. Funnily enough, I've I rarely listened to them back. To be honest, like I'm, I'm more like pen and paper, kind of like making notes what worked. Um, but there might be something where you kind of go something. 
some, some, sometimes you have a routine where something or just a, a bit of a routine where something's working and all of a sudden it's not. It's not working as well. So it's, it's just got to have a reference to go back and go, well, okay, well, was I doing anything different mm. a week ago when it was seemed to be working? Um, and is there any – sorry, finish that. Well, thought. I was just going to say in, in, in Rocky Horror, which I'm doing at the moment, there's a bit – where there's a heckle from the audience, which, you know, it, 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 for those who don't know Rocky Horror, it's it famously, there are these famous heckles that people yell out and, and there's often new ones and, and, and you, so as a narrator, you're responding to the, these heckles and, and but there are some that, you know, happen, you know, each night and and, um, and there's one that's, uh, you know, uh, he's just having a go at the narrator and the, the state of his career uh, or their career. And um, so, and I had these jokes and it was like, th- I, I, do, I, I it started off as two different little bits that I would do. And then I added a, a third bit, and as a result, the bit that I was doing at the the the, the joke that I began with, which was working, wasn't working anymore. And I, I was like, "Why isn't that?" And it, I kind of referenced the project and the joke. I was like, "Why isn't that working as well anymore?" And it's just, I think, simply, it's just because I added the joke, and it's just diminishing returns, you know. Right. Like, so wait, the third joke isn't working, or yeah, well, the second the, joke well, isn't working? Because well, you know third, the third the one's third funny. joke kind of wasn't working as, right. as strong because the first one, first big laugh. Even maybe a bigger laugh, and then, and then the third one. It's, it's not quite, you know. I mean, I could, I could, I thought about changing the order. Can you tell us what the jokes are? Or you don't want to spoil it. Um, I, I yeah, I, I guess I, I, I can. Um, so there's a bit in the show where I say, um, one of the characters, Brad, um, says he's, he's, um, my our relationship with Janet, it's over. The whole thing's over, and the narrator pops out and says, "Over? What was over?" And somebody always yells out, "Your career." <laughs> So I react to that, you know, like the audience is already laughing and oh yeah, before you're even like, so it's perfect. It's so so much fun, and um, and the joke that I was I first said was um, uh, I uh, Rocky Horror and Pete Haley are a natural combination. I'm surprised it hasn't happened earlier. Um, you may ask yourself why. Uh, I, be, I did the project for ten years. I, I've been. I'm used to jumping to the left, or I love jumping to the left. Right, right, um, right. And that, that was getting a really big laugh. And then I added a joke about, how could you say my career is over? Like, Last year, I did, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Okay, maybe you have a point. <laughs> <laughs> and then I added um, the, the really awkward thing is that my, that was my manager who yelled that out, you know, like <laughs> your career, um, which I really love because yeah. one is so economical and quick. Mm. And to the the idea, I do love when you can follow a joke and actually imagine it, and kind of like imagining, <laughs> yeah, why, why would my manager come to see Rocky Horror <laughs> and yell and heckle me and say your career's over? <laughs> this is a very weird thing. So, um, so when I I started with that, and then I went into the I'm a celebrity line, and then I went into the project. So it's just like big laugh, big laugh, and then and then like by the time I got to the project thing, it's just like I, you know. Like mm. It's still a laugh. Like it's still a laugh that generally you'd be usually pretty happy with. I could change the order with it, you know. I could, but to be honest, um, how many laughs do you need? Well, and I do like you do have to be careful of not making it about yourself too much. There's still a story to be told, and there is. I mean, it's, it's not much of a story in Rocky Horror. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there's, yes, there's, there's, there's a bang. I don't think to be, I don't think three gags is going to derail yeah. the complicated <laughs> <laughs> plot. <laughs> there are bangers to be had, you know. So I, I um. But I, uh, there, there, there are some lovely moments that I've kind of created in the, in the, in the, in the show, which I feel like I've got a little bit of space. So it's not a bad time for me to probably move it along a little bit. Right, so, right. So yeah, I'm, I, you try to get that balance right. And do you have? Do you find that when you're doing stand up as well that there's a beautiful joke that you just love, but you can't quite figure out where to put it, or it, like it's coming off the back of something that makes it not work? And yeah, you can't quite figure always, out why it's not working. I, I mean, eventually, I kind of go, well, it's not working enough to be in the show what's its purpose for being in the show is it just to be as to get a laugh uh, which is generally what most jokes are there to do <laughs> but sometimes they're there to set something else up later on you know so yeah, right. sometimes you'll take a, 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 a small little bullet to um, because something else is coming up later on so uh, if, if there's no purpose outside of just being funny and the audience not quite clocking it then generally I'll take it out mm. um but there, there, you know, there are sometimes you kind of go, no, I like this joke, and it's not for everyone in the room. You know, there might be, um, you, might, you know, it might be for sixty percent of the room, and that's okay. You know, and like, once you've got a stand-up special down, is it basically then verbatim once you're touring? Yeah, yeah, uh, yes. It, it, the way I describe it is like when you. Uh, the first time you walk out on stage to do the show, and you, you're warming up to it, so you, you 
I, I what I do, I go at the regional areas and I, I do a show. It's just advertisers like Pete Halley Alive, and I can, you know, if I haven't been to that particular area for you know a year or two, I can do bits of the last show, and I've got all this scaffolding, and then introduce the new material with all this scaffolding around it, and then you start just ripping away the scaffolding, and eventually you have you know an hour, right? Um, and so when you take that show and 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 you start in, I started in Newcastle for this tour I'm on, and um, and you know you are like spending that hour or so leading you, all day. You're thinking about it, the hour leading into it. You know you, you might be writing up the set list again, and 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 that maybe this in your hotel going over the or backstage going over, saying it out loud, just making sure you might hit certain notes and 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 phrasing and and transitions and. Um, and then, and you know, you, there, there's some ex- excitement, some nerves, and, and and yeah, you might arrive like an hour, an hour and a half before the show, um, and then eventually it gets to the point where you could not even think about the show and and walk on. You could arrive at the theater and be on stage a minute mm. later, and, and mm. your heart rate's still the same. You know, it, it's. Um, uh, but what I when I get to that point, what I try to do is change something in the show for to keep me. In it, like right. so, sometimes I even like it's almost like an act of sabotage. Like sometimes during the show, I will deliberately just do something out of order that I know is going to make me have to work it out. Oh, that's stage. interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's almost like yeah, it's like I'm going to not do the setup for the joke that comes later um, and work out how to make it funny. You know, right? Um, and, yeah, I remember in New York, I was friends with a Broadway uh, star. She was starring in Mamma Mia on Broadway and she said that she often, after doing it for months and months and months, she often walks off stage not knowing, not remembering anything about the show and the show comes in within about three seconds to time every night. Yeah. So yeah. you've got like a two-hour show yeah. and it's just this unspooling performance of rote <laughs> kind of performances from everybody. Yeah. And they just – they go out. It's it's muscle memory. Like yeah. there's no changes to it. It's, and I, I, I thought it sort of saps it of a bit of creativity when it gets to that stage, it doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Like, well, sp- speaking to some of the actors who you know, have been doing Rocky Horror for the, in this run almost a year, you know, um, you know they uh, still try to find new things to – Keep them engaged, and and I, I'm been so impressed with one. They're an extraordinary cast, but um, you know, and I've I've sat in the audience quite a few times to, to watch them leading into you know taking on the narrator role, and you know, and then you you, you get to know them, and you, you know, and everyone's got stuff they're dealing with during the day, and and um, they're kind of putting their lives on hold, you know, because you as much as it, you know you do you can kind of rock up to the theater and, and do it, you do have to. Um, you can't let the show float too far away from you. Mm. You know, you do like so during the day. It's weird. You, you just like you wake up in the morning. Is what they've got. Is some of the actors are telling me that, and they were like the first thing, just check their throat. You know, is, is the voice has the voice. You know, um, uh, and the, yeah, their, their ability to change roles as well. Like to you know, like there's somebody who play can play Frankenfurter and Brad, and you know, and, and one of the other you know, and Riff Raff. You know, so it's I think it's extraordinary. But yeah, like they, they've got. You know, they got lives outside of this. But when you're watching, them, you know, from the audience, you have no idea. You know, it's just this magical performance. So you could go, you could have seen it last August and you could have seen it, you know, you could see it tonight and, and it will be, you know, much, much you know, the same performance. And, like you, and, and what about during the days? Are your days, I mean, I would hate it. I just hate the rhythm of having to be at 110% in the evening and the whole day is empty beforehand. I never understood how my dad did it as well, who's a theatre actor for many, many, many years. And, like, I just imagine what it was like having, you know, a couple of, I don't know, primary school-aged boys and dealing with them at the same time as your brain and your heart knows that in three hours' time you're going to be standing in front of hundreds of people having to either cry your eyes out or make them laugh. Yeah, or- and, and for me, doing the role as the narrator, like, it's it's – it's not a particularly stressful role for me. <laughs> I guess like, I'm talking about stand up, yeah, really. Yeah, when you're yeah. on, when you yeah, really I, need to bring it, and it's yeah, just you. Yeah, yeah. Stand up is different because I, I do need to be. It's it's just me. I need to be absolutely engaged and 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 um and focused and um and when I'm starting out a tour, I'm I'm, you know, it's it's a pretty selfish kind of endeavor. I think you know, like because I do have to be in my head. I can't. 
I, I'm pretty good at compartmentalizing, you know, and it, it might mean that, okay, the tour is the most important thing in my life right now, you know, and that doesn't mean I disappear from my family or I don't help out around the house or I'm not, you know. You know not, Papa's locked yeah, in the basement yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't disturb him. That hasn't spoken to us for a week. Um, but, no, it, it, it's, it's just that I will sometimes, even in conversations with my wife, my, my, my mind will float off to something else. She'll say something that triggers an idea or a thought. Yeah. Which is very understanding of like, she'll sometimes just say to me, just go, go, go write it down. <laughs> You'll see that just my eyes yeah. are just like drifted off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, I mean, my partner and I have that and we don't even do stand-up. We just go <laughs> gradually glaze over and yeah, go, yeah, you're not talking to me, are you? Actually? Sometimes it's not just yeah. that stand-up, yeah. But, and so when you put – and what system does that then go into? Are you physically putting it into a notebook and, and yeah. then like going over handwritten notes? Yeah, it's, I, I keep – People often ask about process. My process is like do as much as you can in as many different ways. So I will discover my and expand and, and develop stand up through uh, um, obviously just thoughts coming to your head. And then I write it in my notes on my phone um, and also in a, in a, in a, in a pad of, you know note, notebook. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do some typing. It's funny. I, I, was, I was with some comedians a couple of years ago and um, in Karatha. And they were chatting, and one of them asked the other comedian, "How many words is your show this year?" And they were able to say it's sixty-five thousand seven hundred eighty-two. And then they said, oh, "I said, oh, yeah, mine's seventy-two thousand, blah blah blah." And they said, "What's yours?" I said, "I have, I have no fucking idea. I, I just don't. I have no. It's not how." I, I once I did a show called Frisky and I had so little time to get out and actually kind of develop it that I had to, I, it felt like the, the most written show that I've done. Mm. Um, but that was the only time uh, and I used to just carry it around and read it if I was on a train or in a cab, I'd, I'd like read it just to get it into my head because I wasn't able to get on stage uh, as much as um, I wanted to. Um, so... But I, I, there's no kind of manuscript for any of right. my shows. I remember one thing that you said that really stuck with me, obviously, because it's 10 years later and I still remember it. We were in a production meeting at the project and there was some guest who was coming on and the producers were uh, debating how to introduce them. I don't remember who it was. And they were saying, you know, comedian so-and-so. And you chimed in and said, should we actually say comedian? Like, are they actually a comedian? Yeah. Or are they just like a funny person who does funny things? Right. I thought that was instructive because obviously there's a certain amount of possessiveness if you're a professional stand-up to be like, let's leave comedian to be actual professional comedians. Yeah. There are, I mean, and there are some, you know, I've, I've heard Ricky Gervais get shit for, uh, he basically goes into a room and writes a one-man play and then he comes out and he recites a memorised play right, to yeah. a, an arena, you yeah, know, or yeah. a huge theatre. Yeah. He's not Dave Chappelle who's, you know, dropping by the comedy cellar of a Thursday night at the Late Show and just working on shit constantly and then building up a, ru- a routine yeah. out of that. Yeah. And what, what is the dynamic between the two? Yeah. I mean, Ricky Gervais is, is an outlier as far as, um, like, and I love Ricky Gervais. Um, I necessarily – Agree with everything he says, but that's, and that's, but I, I quite like that as well. Like, um, but I think he's a pretty good ambassador for comedy. Um, it's very rare; like, not many people would do that. It's a luxury that he has. Um, I do sometimes watch some of his specials and think it could have done with you dropping into some rooms and, and developing that idea, yeah, even more. Um, but he, you know, I think he's brilliant. Um, Someone I don't remember which comic it was, but they were giving him shit for his transgender stuff, saying like, "So Ricky doesn't actually go and work as a stand-up comic; he just represents himself as a stand-up comic. So he's really, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, you know, he's like identifying as a stand-up comic, but he's not a natally born stand-up comic. Yeah. If you know what I mean? Yeah, which I, was I, a cute I, twist. I, I have found. Ricky and, and Dave Chappelle's obsession with the trans thing um, a, a bit dull, to, to be absolutely honest. I, I, um, and the war on, on, on wokeism, I find a little a little dull. It's like I feel like wokeism is, is even a thing still. Like, um, um, and they and they developed a, a fair percentage of their shows around. It's like, can you just go back to being? <laughs> well, I mean, with Ricky, I'm not sure that it'll age very well mm. necessarily, and it can seem a bit mean. I find Chappelle's stuff much more interesting because well, think- he's coming at it from, uh, you know, a, 
a well-informed perspective of a person who ex- who lives as a marginalized as part of a marginalized community already. Yeah, and he draws these interesting parallels between. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, just the point, and I can say this as a gay man, just the point that he makes about how fucking quickly society got, got cool with gays in comparison to how bloody long it took yeah. for people to get cool with, like, black people. And, like, you know, it's like the moment <laughs> what, the moment whites have a liberation struggle, it's like, bam, we're done. Like, trans, <laughs> yes, everybody's on board. But, like, you know, the black man is just still, I think that is, is insightful in a yeah, way. That I, Ricky's I, saying, I could identify as a chimpanzee. Is yeah, not. I mean, that's, I mean, that's the, you know, um, that's a whole same-sex marriage thing, isn't it? It's like, oh, what's, what, what next? You know, dogs will marry cats, <laughs> you know, like, and that's, you know, a bit, a bit passe. But um, the... I found Chappelle the one the special before the last one I forget what they're all called um, where he got into a lot of trouble for that. to be honest the, the, the mistake he made for me and he's a, obviously a genius and I will watch everything he puts out um, and I generally love everything about most of the he puts out um, but I just found it dull I kind of found it it, it, it was just it, it, it wasn't funny enough for me um, and dull. but then when he the, the last one he made, where he was almost <laughs> responding to the controversy, I kind of found that uh, more amusing and 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 funny. There were some things I was like, well, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly about that, but um, but generally I found it very funny. And, and um, but I do, I do, I, I'm, I'm. It's just when you know, if you're talking about um, you know, uh, bus strikes for three. You know, uh, for, for three shows in a row, I'd be like, okay, I can get over the bus strike. Right, right, know, right. Like, right. So yeah, it, it's, yeah. it becomes but, a hobby horse. But also, there, like, it, it is a big conversation in the world, and it's you know, like, and I do, I do find it um, interesting when you you can't acknowledge that the world is moving at this really rapid rate, you know, without seeming like you're not being supportive enough or something. Like, yeah, you know, I think about our parents, you know, and. and um, yeah, they just grew up and, and they had, you know, with, things were a bit more black and white, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, there's there's nuance in gender. <laughs> and you're like, there's a what? I mean, there's a lot. Of, yeah, and also, I mean, when you say wokeness, is, is that even sort of a thing now? I mean, maybe the term woke is kind of passe because yeah. it's now just used as a right-wing cudgel to sort of exactly. mean anything that they don't like uh, that's progressive. Exactly but right. there is obviously a phenomenon that still exists that I've experienced myself in uh, working for the public broadcaster where there's a, a sort of a social justice orthodoxy about the way that people ought to think about things. Yeah. concerning race, sex, sexuality, gender, uh, you know, transgenderism yeah. and so on, that if you do want to prod it and poke it and wrestle with it and question it, you know, do we all need to be saying welcomes to country when it's just a bunch of white middle-aged women on a Zoom call uh, doing an <laughs> HR meeting and, you know, they're all doing acknowledgements of country? Like, you can't – to joke about – that would very easily be perceived as being racist to question, you know, if you wanted to do material about yeah. how great, I don't know, trans women are at sport, uh, you'd get into trouble still. So there is, yeah. what do you make of, of the state of censoriousness or yeah, I freedom? Mean, yeah, I mean, you're well aware now that if you, um, it felt like stand up was a safe place to explore ideas and and that the audience were well aware that these are jokes these are jokes and i think we're we we've given comedians too high a perch i think um I, I think we need to kind of just remember that you know they these are jokes and now, you know in recent years you know comedians have become and you know sometimes like blame blame you know maybe they're partially the blame as well for being you know um wanting to Get too serious sometimes, and and, and um, pontificate, and and, um, <laughs> and it's, it's just like, can we just get back? You know, and sometimes I and I, 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 flip, I flip a bit about it because sometimes I'm like, can we just get back to being this, this doing the jokes? Mm. And, and then there are times where I'm like, no, you know, like this is a, you know, it's 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 good. And the older I get as a comedian, I, I do want to explore ideas that you know, like I used to go. The first few years I did comedy, you're just like you're walking around, and uh, you know the ideas are floating to your head, and you're kind of like, okay, yeah, that's a joke. I'll put it, you know, I'll say that, and yeah, it, it felt very kind of easy in a way. And um, and now what what I try to do is go, okay, what do I actually want to talk about? You know, what are the things that I actually want to address? 
and I take it, uh, uh, you know, this is what I want to say. How do I make it funny as opposed to the funniness leading to the funny? Uh, from a writing perspective, I'm going, okay, like for this re- recent show, I'm, I'm exploring the idea of like this. You have these people who say we live in this age where you can't say anything anymore and that's what all people want to talk to comedians about is you can't say anything anymore. Yeah, right. Like it's, it used to be, how do you come up with material? That was the number one question. Now with a bullet, it's – it's. Um, well, I've already gone through how do you come up with your material. Now we're on to <laughs> you can't say anything anymore. So I'm, yeah. glad, that, I'm glad we're but, really f- – this is new ground but the we're thing covering. I, the thing I explore in the show is like you, can, you say you can't say anything anymore but we also live in this age where more than any other time in human history we are bombarded by uh, opinions from people we don't know. Like I would argue that more – than any other time in history, you can say whatever you like, but there are always ramifications if you you know if you say certain things. Now, um, yeah, so I right, but isn't the question how tight do you draw the boundary around where those ramifications kick uh, in and how how intense should the ramifications be? So, I mean, I, 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 listen, who's really been cancelled? You know what I mean? Like we talk about cancel culture all the time, like, and we're not talking. Harvey Weinstein wasn't cancelled. He no, was arrested he was, and put in jail. He was a rapist. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he, was, he was also a rapist. He was a rapist, exactly right. So it's like people talk, you know, like like the criminals, the justice system will handle the criminals. Right. You know. No, but I like, mean- there's, there's not many comedians really- Well, I mean- Who have been cancelled. Isn't it possible that there are young comedians who aren't as prominent as they would be because they're sort of regarded as being, you know, you don't really- I don't really talk to them. I mean, I certainly know that in journalism there would be people who'd be regarded, and I may be one of them, as, you know, oh, he's always doing his fucking uncomfortable conversations. Does he need to, be kick- Does he need to always kick a hornet's nest, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, do we we want – there is a – there's a caution. And, I mean, who's been – like, I wouldn't say that J.K. Rowling's uh, reputation has emerged unscathed. Like, she's still very, very wealthy. Yes. But it does matter that – She's not invited to, <laughs> you know, yes. fancy parties. No, She's yeah, regarded it, as being demonic. And like. I, guess, I guess I was probably kind of keeping it in the comedy world as far as um, um, JK, I'm sure, is amusing. Um, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if her trans stance is, is being based on trying to get laughs or, yeah, uh, right. or, or, or not. Like, like, very few, like Kevin Hart, you know, um, uh, you know, they found some old tweets from him and, and, and then he – had to give up hosting the, the, the Oscars. So what did we achieve? Uh, uh, having a, a black man who'd worked really hard to get where he is, you know, made some, you know, off-colour remarks on, on Twitter, which he'd already apologised for. So we've robbed the black man the opportunity of hosting an Oscars, which has really weren't, been done Weren't before. you just saying that nobody has been cancelled? That well, would be an yeah, example. But, okay, yes, yeah. but then Kevin Hart's making more movies and making more money now. So what was the point of, you know... Robbing him of one gig. Yeah, but they did rob him of one gig. Yeah. And, but, like, you know, Aziz Ansari had the, you know, <laughs> there was this embarrassing but, moment where he was nominated for an Emmy and nobody clapped because, you know, he had a fumbled date that yes. someone wrote about, uh, you know, how he- Aziz Ansari, you know- wasn't with, very good lay. Without going in this very into, yeah, all the details. That, that was the almost the one I was like, oh, this is- this is getting into some dangerous areas here because it's like this- It was a fumbled date, really. It was almost like, oh- there's a consensual, um, you know, uh, sex had gone on, but there was a regret to it. Um, and Anthony Ansari all of a sudden- He wasn't very good in the sack, loses, therefore he can't regret. have a television show. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, it, it, and is that what this movement is really about? Like, um, so that was- So you don't feel any, like, it, does it ever happen to you? I mean, at the risk of being predictable about like, oh, you can't say anything, but I am interested. Like, does it ever happen to you that you're wandering along or you're, you're sitting on the tram and you go, oh, this would be that, you know, what would be funny? And then you go, That's a, that would be tricky. There's some times where I've kind of gone, I did have a routine about race, about- um, this is your famous N word routine where you just said, said the N word <laughs> yeah. over and over again it's a, it's a, and shouted at all the black people and get very uncomfortable. <laughs> shouted at all the black people in the audience yeah. to leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> no, my routine was, and I kind of spoke to a few people about it. The kind of and 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 they were you know uh, people of, of of color, BIPOC people, and 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 they were like, it's great, like it's it's, it's kind of bulletproof, you know, like. And it was the idea was. Um, is like that I that I can I can actually see I've got a special power a superpower and I kind of whisper it I kind of go I can actually see race I can see it <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it's you know based on the idea of people go, oh, I don't see race I don't see race yeah, well, yeah, like, yeah. of course you, you, yeah, you do yeah yeah you do like yeah. and um, 
<laughs> That's very funny. And but, and like so, everyone I've spoken to has that reaction. Everyone laughs yeah, when I, I can talk about race. it, but the audience gets really uncomfortable, right? And in the end, I kind of just dropped it because I just thought, well, maybe the audience, my audience, doesn't really need me to talk about race, you know, as a. But maybe you know, they do. Like well, maybe, maybe Australia maybe do. does need. Uh, a straight white middle aged male comedian talking about race because there's a there are a lot of straight white middle aged men in Australia who feel like the climate is not such that they're able to wrestle with these things. They're just being forced to follow a particular orthodoxy that somebody else decided on. Somebody else who may not be a person of colour themselves, somebody else who might be a university educated social justice, you know, yeah, warrior. I mean, it, it, it's it's it is interesting. I mean, many years ago, you know, and this is going back to 20 years or plus, I, I remember doing, and this is back, you know, I always think comedy is better for it for, for, for evolution. You know, like we need to evolve. We, I'm glad we're not doing mother-in-law jokes, you know, still, yeah, you know. Right. And, um, um, and so early 2000s, I, I was doing a routine which involved a, a very light, you know, um, Chinese accent. Um <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was talking about a, a, an exchange I had with a, a, a lady in the shop. Right. Um, and I, I, I enjoy a role play. So I was doing, you know, like, it was deliberately like a light kind of, you know, like it, it would get a laugh and and, and, um, and I, would kind of, I would address it with the audience, that, you know, that I have to, you know, I play everyone on stage. I'm not sure if you know this. And, you know, so I have to, you know, separate myself from the shopkeeper to kind of paint the picture of what was going on. Um, and we have we have some fun with that. And and a friend of mine said to me, you know, I said, oh, what do you think? I just, you know, I don't know. Uh, and it wasn't about it being funny. It was, it was very funny, you know. And and, and they, he said to me, are they laughing? Because a lot of the end of routine was also about um, that you know, migrants come to Australia and they learn that, you know, they learn a second language or they three or four languages and we only we know the one language. And, and that was kind of, you know, the broader point that I was kind of making. So it was kind of, I was having a go at Maybe the laziness of, of Australians who are only, you know, having no interest in learning a second language, and um, and he said to me, "Are they laughing at that like that point, or are they laughing because you're just doing a silly accent?" And I said, "I think they're laughing because I'm doing a silly accent," and I so I just stopped doing the routine. Um, and um, it can be a little from column A and a little from column B, it, 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 can't it? It, it? it can be, and I. Um, yeah, you know, for for years I was like, why can we do some accents and we can't do some? You know, I did it in Skid House, we did a sketch basically, you know, based on that as well. Um, so I've always kind of been curious and, and fascinated by what- Yeah, you could do a French accent, no problem. Yeah, you can up. lay into the French as much as you want for <laughs> yeah, some reason, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, no, it's interesting. I mean, I think back to, I mean, I, my first job was doing funny voices on, uh, on the radio here and writing and performing satirical comedy sketches on Mike Carlton's show. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think of the stuff we did in the mid 2000s when I was uh, fresh out of uni. And um, a lot of it you couldn't do. I mean, I was playing, you know, Saddam Hussein with like this incredibly <laughs> racist sounding like Arab Arabic accent and uh, stereotypes of gay people that were very stereotypically gay. And uh, um, was it? But the jokes were good. I mean, I think I was writing funny jokes <laughs> as well, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, but yeah. they were certainly enhanced by the well, ludicrousness of the performance. I've certainly spoken to a lot of actors who are like, you know, we need to act. Like we can't. And sometimes it involves di uh, uh, different voices. Now, nobody's, you know, kind of saying they, you know, defending Mickey Rooney in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Oh, mind like you. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, Dad did that. There was an oh, Australian really? show in, it must have been the 70s or 80s. I've seen video of it. <laughs> they needed a Vietnamese Australian doctor. So they just put plastic. Uh, eyes on my dad and brown him up and like you can go back and look at like there's not a single Vietnamese person you can find in Australia <laughs> to play this part so he's like putting on a Vietnamese accent with like these hooded uh, you know pla pla cosmetic surgery sort of plastic you know what do you call it like special effects essentially yeah. to make his eyes look slanty and as recently as when you know as recently as when he was acting what thirty or forty years ago? That was there was nobody. No, at no point in the process did anyone put up their hand and go, "Should we? Should we just find an Asian?" <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and this is why, this is why it is good that we have, we we, we listen to you know, um, 
you know, messages from, from the community and society and, and, and evolve because, yeah, it, it, like there, there, there is a line, I think, now, and, and the line's always going to be a bit blurry and, and the line will always move. And um, But actors do, I think, still need to be able to act. Like this, you know, I, I think it was um, Bill Burr did, you know, a great routine about um, that French film um, about the... Is a black man and the uh, paraplegic, and he becomes his carer. Um, Diving Bell and the Butterfly? No, that wasn't. No, black it was, was, was a, a, the Upside or, or the Upside or some, something like that. Oh, yeah. And it was a yeah, big French film, and then they made an American remake, and Brian Cranston played the. Um, the I, I believe it was a paraplegic. I apologise if I. Um, Got that then, then, were you wondering who gets cancelled for what? That's it. <laughs> that's, it that's it. There we found, we found it. it was a quadriplegic or, or, or paraplegic, and. and and there were people in the community who were upset that, um, that why couldn't they be, you know, find, they a, find a, a real a, a quadriplegic, paraplegic, or quadriplegic. quadriplegic act, act, yeah. actor? Yeah. Now, you can argue that, but the, the point is, like, that movie, the reality is that movie probably doesn't get made with that actor. Because, yeah, right. Because there are certain boxes the investors need ticked off. They, they want somebody but Also, of Brian not- Cranston's an amazing actor. He's one in... A hundred million. So you need, like, you need to allow him to act. Yeah. He, he can't just be Brian Cranston all the time. Like, he, need, he needs to be able But also, to- how many paraplegic or quadriplegic actors well, are of Brian Cranston's calibre? I think, I, I, I'm not sure if I kind of thought of this when I was watching it, but or Bill Burr actually said it, but he goes, like, who's your favourite quadriplegic <laughs> actor? <laughs> right. You know, like, right. If, if you can't name one, then you're part of the yeah, problem. You yeah. know, like- but I mean, also, like, I mean, this comes up with gay roles as well all the time, right? And like, uh, you know, so what was it? Um, there was a trans. There was a whole movie yeah. that didn't get made because it was no, a non-trans it was, it was, actress it was, playing. Was it Hedwig in the um, Angry Inch? Well, there was that, but this is also different. Uh, uh, no, there was a remake of an Asian movie. <laughs> this is really entertaining for people to listen to us just trying to remember <laughs> movies that we can't <laughs> remember. remember. Welcome back to movies, <laughs> movies we can't remember <laughs> and can't properly describe with Peter and Josh. Uh, no, anyway. So, but the, I mean, one point that was made to me by uh, someone who's skeptical of this whole thing was like and who's also gay was like i mean if you only if gay people are insisting that straight people should not be able to play gays are they okay with us insisting that gay people can only play gay characters yeah and the gay people shouldn't be allowed to play straight that's it and also do you have to declare yeah that's right is there at the audition (laughs) yeah what what if people who are are not out yet or or, Mm. you know like Mm. so i i yeah I, i do think there needs to be um space for actors to, to you know apply their craft and the in terms of like the worthiness of when you were talking about like you just want comedy to sort of be comedy again i mean this is going back to dave Chappelle, he gets stuck into hannah gadsby for basically not being funny right like for, for coming up doing a one woman show which is very worthy which has a lot there's there's a there's a, a kind of a noble instinct in audiences to find profound Social justice revelations. Yes, uh, it, it, to to feel compelled to respect that, y- regardless yes. of whether or not it's. I mean, I, actually I, funny. I think cause I follow. I followed the, the Hannah, and I interviewed Hannah quite a few times for the project. Um, you know, uh, post uh, Nanette, and um, the one thing that people miss, I think, when they're talking about uh, Nanette, is that it was funny for like, for like. However long, forty minutes or forty-five minutes, whatever. Whenever that turning point is, that last 10, 15 minutes where it's like a blistering kind of, you know, like um, monologue, um, it's really funny up until that point. I mean, watching it, going, you know, "What's this whole thing about it not being funny?" It's really funny, and then and then it and it really goes for it. And I think people just remember that people think the hour is at fifteen minutes or twenty minutes, whatever it may be, um, and. Yeah, as much as I like, and like I said, I do flip sometimes. I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's just go back to being funny and telling jokes. And other times I'm like, no, but comedy can be more and we could be, you know. I mean, the best thing, obviously, is if you can do both, right? I mean, Bill yes. Burr is a good example, I think, of someone who makes, pr- like, if you can say things that are profoundly contrarian and genuinely risque in a way that is intellectually rigorous and also funny, but, that's the bullseye, and right? And Bill Burr does, it, it maybe he's the best at it. Of, Making jokes that, about something that happens in you know, an issue in society, but he's almost catering to both sides in a way. Like, he, like he's he's not he's not. I mean, he's pretty anti woke. Yeah, yeah, but at the same time, I I think he also has some kind of uh, um, 
You're right. He's anti. Yeah, yeah. He, but he, he he's is. smart about it. Like yeah. So he, I think you could be you could be woke and listening to his you know um, his stand up and still smile and or, or even laugh along and kind of go yeah it's a it's a fair point. You're like I think <laughs> yeah. You, 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 yeah. I think you're pretty aware of where his tongue is in his cheek. You know. Yeah. How far yeah, it is yeah, in his cheek. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's the same with Louis. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, for all of you know, scandal noted uh, yes, about Louis yeah, C.K. Yeah. Not good to do the things he did. Yeah. Nonetheless, uh, I think an incredible stand up. I went and saw him in, in Sydney, and he did. He has a bit speaking of accents where he's talking about uh, seeing an old black lady in a supermarket, and he go, he does a voice where he's like, "Oh, look at this old <laughs> potato I got here," or something like that. And everybody has that. Instinctive, like half laugh, half gasp, half like, should he really be doing yeah. a voice? And he looks at the audience and he's like, that's how she spoke. I'm yeah. not being racist. Like, yeah. she's racist if you think that voice is racist because that was her <laughs> voice. Like, all I'm doing is just a perfect simulacrum of what the of yeah. what she was saying, which again is like, he's only doing it in order to be able to make that point. Yeah. Right? Well, we, we had we, 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 Ronnie Chang, you know, um, was yeah, did two episodes of It's a Date. Uh, for us, an anthology series I, I kind of created on the ABC, and and we had people, you know, a couple of people, kind of, you know, on socials, kind of saying, "Oh, in this day and age, you're really going with that accent." It's like, that's how he speaks. <laughs> that's Ronnie. That's, that's Ronnie Chang. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's 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 incredible. We had in How to Say Married a character um, uh, who. Um, yeah, like really, uh, I, I'm trying to think of her background. Uh, I'm just going to say, with apologies, um, just Asian, uh, but I'm not exactly sure which country is. Uh, cancelled again. Yeah, cancelled again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, you can just call her a yellow person. I think that's the <laughs> that's what you're supposed to say these days. <laughs> and we said to her, we said to her, you play, how do you want to play this character? Like, you know, do you want to like lean into, you know, the, she, we would work out where she's from, and, and and or do you want to play like you know knock her Aussie? She goes, no, let's let into the Asianness. It's kind of funny, you know. And and um and we, and we gave her carte blanche to kind of go, you do whatever you know, do it. And and she really went for it, you know, mm. like she really went for it. And I, I thought it was hilarious, you know. And both this, she was bringing stuff and finding physicality to it that really made it really funny. Yeah, and th- but yeah, there were some people going, you know, still going, oh really, you know? Yeah, it's like, I mean, please this come is on, like, look, like uh, look at her, like this is yeah. coming from this is coming yeah. from her, like you know, this is. It's so choosing. bossy. It's so puritanical. It's so sort of finger waggy to be like my version of diversity it has to be the one that yeah. everybody has to agree with instead yeah. of the one that the actual Asian Australian actress want, thinks is funny. Yeah, you know, uh, Michael Hing has a bit about <laughs> asking himself pensively whether or not he's a China man. He's like, because <laughs> he's a Chinese Australian comic. Yeah. He's like, you know. I guess I'm a, I'm a Chinaman. I'm a Chinaman. <laughs> am, I, am I a Chinaman? It's really funny because, like, yeah, yeah, it's such an old school word. Yeah. We wouldn't be able to say it. No. He can say it because yeah. he's a fucking Chinaman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and on on the the stand up is also in the news because of this whole incident about the the baby that was making noise at Arj Barker, yeah. Barker's show. Talk to me about the focus that you need when you're on stage and you're hearing something from the audience and the decision about whether or not <laughs> to intervene. Yeah, the, the, the one thing that I, I read about the, 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 the mother, you know, and I, I hate it, to be honest, that in, in some ways she's being shamed and I hate it that, you know, that, that Arj is being shamed because I think there's – yeah, it, it's it's tricky. But it, the one thing that I read that she said that I, I do disagree with um, – is she said, uh, you know, you have hecklers. You know, my baby was making some noises, but you know, you have hecklers. Isn't it the same thing? And it's clearly not the same thing. So with a heckle, you can respond to that because it's it's something that somebody has said that you have then they've given you um, material to work with. You know, like they've said, you know, it, it, it could be you're not funny or like whatever it might be. But it, it might be trying to add to a joke or something, and you can then play with that. The worst thing as a stand up when you're on stage is if somebody's chattering and you can't, they're not really yelling out that it's chattering amongst themselves because this noise and you can hear it and you can't really respond to it because you, you're not catching what they're actually talking about, which is what the, you know, you can't respond to a baby. So, because it's just noises and a baby just, you know, they just don't understand because they're a baby. Um, and so I, 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 I do think, listen, I don't, I don't think taking a baby to a stand up, um, 
gig is helpful for for uh, the the comedian and potentially people around you. Uh, I sympathise with, you know, I'm I'm often impressed, you know, when I see, um, you know, parents out with you know babies and and like you know it's still, you know, we're not going to be tucked away. We can get out and enjoy ourselves too. Um, but there's no denying that it's it's. Um, Unless that baby's sleeping and not making any noise, it, it's it's it can be a distraction. And how because, you- because with ours as well, and I'm certainly someone like this. I I need um, that room to be quiet when I want when I need it to be quiet. You know, when I want the room full of laughter, you know, that's that's great. But it's not it's not a stand-up show isn't 100 percent laughter, laughter, laughter all the way through. It's not 60 minutes of laughter. There are times when you are setting stuff up and you need quiet. In my venue this year, that in my first show, there was somebody making. I heard because it was it was in a pub, and um, I heard ksh, ksh, occasionally, and I thought I was making a coffee, um, and it was really distracting. And they were I, just I, getting high I, on I nitrous know. oxide bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> so we, what, what was it? it was, they were pouring um, like the soft soda. Drinks. Oh right. Yeah, yeah. So that was the. Um, and I said to him, I said, oh, can we can we not make coffees during the, during a the show? And it's like, it was really distracting. And 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 um and they said, oh, it was strange. But and then they fixed it. They they kind of worked out a way they could not do it during the show. Um, and but it was it, you know I, it was something that I had to kind of talk to them about because it was enormously distracting. Like you are like there are times when you are tr- you are curating this silence in, in a studio in, in a theater. And one little noise, whether it be a soda, you know, a soda stream or a um, somebody coffee or even somebody coughing, you know, or or, or a baby, you know, takes takes it the moment away mm. a little bit. So um, I think people don't appreciate what's actually happening on stage. I, 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 no, I, I think I, they think I, you I just go agree. in and the stand up just does their thing, and you know, people laugh and that's that. They don't understand. The and craft. comedians, we'd love, we'd love to talk about in the way like. The, the craft and and and, and that because the whole thing is supposed to look effortless and, and easy and 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 we we generally talk down what we actually do but but there is a lot of work that has gone on to get to where like someone like Arj is and they, even to get that show ready um, and let's I don't think I would have asked the the mother to leave um, I, I do I generally have empathy you know uh, for her why not um, I mean, if if you're uh, if you're if you're doing brain surgery on stage, essentially, mm-hmm. and you're curating each moment, and you know that this line is going to end in a silence and a beat, and then you're going to yank the rug out from under the audience's legs with yeah. a big punchline, and then in that space, there's like a a cry, and it snaps your attention out of it. It breaks the moment for the audience. People start shuffling in their seats a little bit, and the little d- joke doesn't quite land. Well, what do you do? Well, well, I'd probably have to write it off a little bit. Like, uh, there'll be ways I could deliver it differently. Kind of going, okay, I need to maybe move through this a bit quicker than I normally would. But then I would be saying to the the, the, the staff, uh, no more babies in the audience. Well, apparently it said fifteen plus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, baby, but had what fake, about- baby had a fake ID. <laughs> Kaka <laughs> Google. Uh, I mean, then you're basically if you if you write, if you hurry through it because the baby is going to screw the joke, then you're ripping off the other hundreds of people who came to see you at your best. Well, yeah, and 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 that that is it's <laughs> that is the complication. It's not just about Arj being or the say, the comedian in that moment being about him. Like you are trying to service your audience. They all paid money. Yeah, they all paid money, and. Um, I don't know, mate, mate. Except for the baby, probably. The baby, baby probably didn't need a ticket. That's a good point, actually. That yeah. mean, uh, sunrise Did the baby buy a that. ticket? Mm. Um, but uh, maybe, maybe comedians, maybe we should be doing mums and bubs sessions, you know. Like. <laughs> but that's the thing. I mean, I, it's, it, this is a perfect distillation of, like, what's crazy about our con- national conversations and the way social media deranges them because everyone started taking these very hot stances on either side of this, I, uh, of this I, story. I can't it's believe like, how big the, the story is. It's ridiculous. Become. It's like so... Yeah, being a parent to a young baby is really hard. Anyone who's been a parent knows it's really hard. God bless people who want to go out, as you say. Go to a mums and bubs session at the movies. They have those. You know, go to kid friendly cafes. I've had to have. I've had nine month old twins like driving me absolutely batshit crazy. Yeah, but respect like 
certain spaces. Yeah. Respect certain crafts. Respect the other people who've paid a bit of money. This is not like a, a hill to die on. I don't get it. Like, it's like you read some of the things from Mamma Mia or one of these other outlets, and it's like this is like the civil rights movement of our of our time, that women should be able to bring gurgling, crying, screaming little babies into everywhere in the world, including the most, this kind of sanctum of intimacy, which is a stand-up I mean, room. I, I mean, personally, I mean, again, um, I, I, I'm just not sure how you would enjoy it, to be honest. I'd be worried, constantly worried, <laughs> you, know, be, that, you know. that I, I'd be freaking out the whole time. Yeah. And, and the, the mum that's got a Husey show... And she made the point that Husey, you know, acknowledged it, made a point, made a joke and moved on with his show and like, was commending him for his professionalism. And Husey certainly uh, is a professional. But I'll, I would make the point that Husey and Arj are very different comedians. Husey doesn't leave the space. He, he doesn't He doesn't crave those silences. He's not like role-playing. Husey's very jokey and, and, and um, you know, and I saw his show this, this year. It's, you know, hilarious and, and, and um, he's brilliant. But, but he's not... He's not trying for those moments where mm. Aj uh, does, you know, and, and I, I do as well. I, I, I need the room for this room to be absolutely pinpoint silent for, for the next 10 seconds, you know, mm. uh, or, or three seconds or seven seconds, whatever it might be. Um, so, I, I, again, I'd also make that point. Well, I mean, yeah, so they're different uh, types of comedy. But is, did she go to Husey's show before... Did she go to an early Husey show? Like, did she go to two shows? <laughs> like, not only is she dragging the kid around to a stand-up show, she's doing a double header. She obviously had a festival pass and she wanted to get <laughs> maximum bang for her buck. Um, no, like, I, 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 no, maybe another My impression day. was it was a different day. Yeah. All right, okay. Yeah, but yeah. the kid's getting dragged around to <laughs> all of the greatest hits. Yeah. You can look forward to it. Maybe it should be at Rocky Horror. I, I'm going to follow this, baby. This baby might be like a legendary comic <laughs> in, you know, 20 years. Exactly. Um, yeah, no, that's. What do you make of the of the way that we're talking to each other on social media? Are you on social media? I, I, I am, but I, I'm, I'm losing a, a bit of interest there. To hear the rest of this conversation, go to uncomfortableconversations.substack.com slash listen, and you will get your own personal premium podcast feed with at least three extra episodes of the podcast every month and heaps of extra stuff, including the remainder right now of the fabulous conversation you've just been hearing. If it was worth listening to this much of... Don't rob yourself of the rest. Pull out your phone right now and search for uncomfortable conversations with Substack. Substack.